Hi everybody, today I want to share some thoughts with you on the subject of Game On. Now Game On, I'm not talking about a TV show that was over in Britain a number of years ago called Game On. And I'm not talking about a comic book company called Game On, but I'm talking about that term that means that you're ready to accept a challenge or ready to get something done. I think some of us have been challenged at times to get something done when we didn't really think that we could get stuff done. Over in the book of Proverbs, in the Bible, in chapter 24, it says this. It says, even if good people fall seven times, they will get back up. You know how difficult it is sometimes to get back up? I think oftentimes that when people read the Bible, they pick certain things. They don't take the whole message and put it in context. So if you widen that lens a little bit in Proverbs chapter number 24, a paraphrase of that text says, don't interfere with good people's lives. Don't try to get the best of them. No matter how many times you trip them up, God loyal people don't stay down long. Soon they're up on their feet while the wicked end up flat on their faces. Don't laugh when your enemy falls, and don't crow over his collapse. God might see him become very provoked and then take pity on his plight. I think some of us, many times, we get kind of frustrated about how it seems evil people or bad people seem to get by with things. And sometimes I think the temptation is when we, are, when we see this, and maybe sometimes they fall on their face or get caught, we want to get happy about it. Well, the Bible tells me that I shouldn't be happy about it. So the text today, the big picture today, is game on. You know, I find it always interesting in many sports, whether it's baseball or sometimes basketball, football, soccer, a variety of different games, that at the end of each game... Uh, Some of the players line up and congratulate each other on how their game went. But there also are characteristics that you and I have to have when we are attempting to have a game on attitude. Let me share a story. Eric Ferguson shared this story. He says, back when the telegraph was the fastest means of long-distance communication, there was a story about a young man who applied for a job as a Morse code operator And answering an ad in the newspaper, he went to the address that was written down on the ad. When he arrived, he entered a large, noisy office, and in the background, a telegraph was just crackling away. A sign on the receptionist's counter instructed this job applicant to fill out a form and and wait until they were summoned to enter the inner office. The young man completed his form and sat down with seven other waiting applicants. After a few minutes, the young man stood up and crossed the room to the door of the inner office and then walked right in. Naturally, the other applicants perked up, and they were wondering what was going on. Why had this been, this guy been so bold just to walk into the office uninvited? Well, they muttered among themselves, and they hadn't heard anybody call him in, so they took a little less satisfaction in knowing that he was the last guy who walked in, but the first guy who came into the inner office. He was a little upset about that. So within a few minutes, the young man emerged from the inner office, escorted by the interviewer, who announced to the other applicants, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming, but the job has been filled by this young man. The other applicants began grumbling to each other, and then one spoke up, wait a minute, just wait a minute, I don't understand. He was the last one to come in, and we never even got a chance to be interviewed. Yet he got the job, that's not fair. The employer responded, all the time you've been sitting here, you see, the telegraph has been ticking out the following message in Morse code. If you understand this message, then come right in. The job is yours. None of you heard it or understood it. This young man did, so he got the job. I think you and I have to do work much harder than the average person in order to have a game on attitude. I think also intense consistency, this is huge, intense consistency is a characteristic that the best of the best seem to develop in themselves. Again, intense consistency 
intense consistency is a character, characteristic that the best of the best seem to develop in themselves. In the Bible, in the New Testament, there's a, there's a text that says in Hebrews chapter 12, let's run with determination the race that's set before us. Run with determination. Do you know how difficult it is to run with determination? When you get knocked down over and over again, it's really difficult to maintain a game on attitude when you keep getting knocked down over and over and over again. I think sometimes you and I have a tendency to give up just before we win. Sometimes we give up just before we break through some really amazing times in our lives, just short of those amazing times because the consistency and the stick to has been so, so frustrating. Uh, there's, a, there's so many stories out of people that have overcome challenges. But St. Paul in the New Testament was a very interesting gentleman. St. Paul was a guy who persecuted the early church. He was a Jewish man. He was well known in the region. And he frankly helped get Christians killed some 2,000 years ago. Well, after an event in his life, he became a Christian, and he began to preach and teach the, the stories of Jesus and a whole lot of good stuff about Jesus. But over in Philippians chapter 1, he was, uh, he was arrested and put in jail. In fact, he was put in jail several times, and a bunch of other bad things happened to him. But, but in, in Philippians chapter 1, the Amplified Bible puts it the, 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 this way. It says, Now I want you to know, believers that what has happened to me, this, this imprisonment that was meant to stop me, listen to his attitude here. He was in prison. Now, we're not talking just the prisons of, of these days, which they're nice, and you get three meals a day. and We're talking a dungeon, you know, where he was, he was in a very, very bad place. He says that this, this prison sentence that he was given was meant to stop him. But it goes on to say, he says, but my imprisonment has become common knowledge throughout the whole region, and because of his chains, listen, because of his chains, because of his, his difficulty, the message of Jesus grew as a result of him being in prison. Now, that's, that's, not, that's not a lifestyle I choose to have. Another way to say this is, I want to report to you, Paul said, friends, that my imprisonment here has been the opposite of what was intended. In fact, instead of being squelched, the message has actually prospered. You know how difficult it is to, to keep moving forward when things in your life come at you in such an intense way that you just want to run the opposite direction or you want to run away, you, you want to give up, you want to throw in the towel? I've been there, done that, am there, struggling with that this moment. It's really hard to keep moving forward when life keeps hitting you in the face over and over again. Even while Paul was in prison, he had a game on attitude. Can you have a game on attitude when you're getting hit over the head all the time? Health issues slow you down. Employment issues slow you down. Other issues that, that come up in your life just keep punching you in the face over and over again and you still have a game on attitude. It is hard to have a game on attitude. And I think sometimes our, the, the, the folks that are against us sometimes often become our greatest benefactors because we don't give up in the darkest of times. I, I did a speech in the last few weeks, and the speech, from what I was told by people who were there, inspired them not to complain and not to whine and not to give up when they're hit with far less than what our family's been hit with over the years. So I don't necessarily want to be the example of that, to be candid with you. I don't want to be hit over in the head over and over again. My family to be set back over and over again to necessarily encourage other people. But that's a byproduct sometimes of you going through some very difficult times. You and I have the opportunity so many times to either throw in the towel, to run the opposite direction, or to keep moving forward. There's a story I read. Uh, Dr. Hugh Herr is a teacher at MIT in both the media department and the health sciences and technology department. Herr is also the director of another group, and they dedicate themselves to, to human mechanics and development of, of other things. The long and short story of this, that he was able, through some very difficult times, to invent some tools 
for hurting people, amputees and other stricken people that have enabled them to keep moving forward in, in their lives. And I would dare say to you, and I know certainly in my life, that the toughest times that you go through are the times that can pull you to a position in your life that you would not have reached if you had not gone through those difficult times. And I'll, I'll tell you flat out, I don't like difficult times. I don't like the times when I feel like throwing in the towel and giving up and, and just jumping off a bridge, to be quite honest with you here today. Sometimes you got to keep moving forward even though you don't feel like it. Author C. Clark said once, the only way of discovering the limits of possible, of what's possible, listen, is to venture a little past them into the impossible. The only way of discovering, again, the only way of discovering the limitations of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. You know how hard it is? There, there was a story in the Bible about Peter and Jesus, and the story says that Jesus was walking on the water in, in this storm. And Peter and his chums, his friends, were fishing. And to make a very longer story short, Peter was encouraged to jump out of the boat and walk on the water, believe it or not, like Jesus did. And Peter was doing great until he saw the surroundings. He saw the storm. He saw the waves. The water spray was hitting him in the face. And he realized, what in the world did I just do? Then he started to sink. I wonder how many times you and I have, if you will, stepped out of the boat, stepped on the water to do things that were slightly intimidating. And then once we were out there doing it, we realized, oh my God, what have I done? And then we start to panic. We start to fear. We start to get intimidated. When you have a game on attitude, when you, when you have an attitude that no matter what happens, I'm going to keep moving forward, that can not only change your life, but the lives of people in your life. And that, that can be, be mind-blowing. And I could go into a whole lot of details about that as well. What if what you believe is impossible, that's out of the question, is really not? Let me ask it again. What if, you, what, if what you believe is impossible or out of the question is really not? How many times have you gone through life and been um, encouraged or challenged or had a desire to do the extraordinary, but you didn't think that you could do the extraordinary? Maybe you thought, you know, I want to do something fantastic in life, or I, I want to make a difference in people's lives around the world, or I want to, I want to go places, I want to do things, I want, to, I want to invent something, or I want to create an environment, or I want to build a company, or I, whatever, whatever it is. But then those little seeds of doubt come at you, and then over the months and over the years, that just fades away, fades away, because you know what? You gave up because you allowed the difficulties, you allowed the doubts, to take over in your own life. And now those dreams now are decades old and you never really got a chance to do it. Travis J. shares an interesting story. And I love the story because it's so true in my life and I think it's also true in your life. He said, the Japanese have always loved fresh fish, but the waters close to Japan have not held many fresh fish for decades. So to feed the Japanese population, Fishing boats got bigger, and they went farther than ever. The farther the fishermen went, the longer it took to bring in the fish, and if the return trip took more than just a few days, the fish were not fresh. The Japanese did not like the taste, because remember, they like fresh fish. So to solve this problem, fishing companies installed freezers on their boat. They would catch the fish and freeze them at sea. Freezers allowed the boats to go farther and stay longer. However, the Japanese, believe it or not, could taste the difference between fresh and frozen, and they did not like frozen fish. So the frozen fish, of course, then brought a lower price. So fishing companies installed fish tanks. Great idea. They would catch the fish and stuff them in the tanks, and after a little thrashing around, the fish stopped moving. They were tired and dull, but they were alive. Unfortunately, the Japanese could taste the difference of these fish that were uh, thrashing around but still not fresh. They could taste the difference. Because the fish didn't move for days, they lost their, their fresh fish taste. So the Japanese preferred lively fish, not sluggish fish. 
So how did Japanese fishing companies solve this problem? How did they get fresh tasting fish to Japan? How did the Japanese manage to keep the fish fresh? So to keep the fish tasting fresh, the Japanese fishing companies still put the fish in the tanks, but now they add a small shark into the tank. But now they see the, the shark eats a few fish, but most of the fish arrive at a very lively state because, listen, the fish are challenged. The text today is called Game On. Sometimes you have to place in your life, and I have to place in my life, challenges that keep us moving. Because the tendency for some of us, not all of us, but some of us have a tendency to, to take the easy route, to take it slow, to, to kind of evolve slowly to a place that maybe we, we really want to be. But that's not how you have a game one attitude. So many people I've read about and met they do the good thing, they do what's difficult even when they don't feel like doing what's difficult. Today I went to the gym before I came into the studio to record this and I did not feel like going to the gym. I mean, I was you know, tired, I hadn't been to the gym for a couple of days and I did not feel like going. But I know that if I don't go, then what's gonna happen? Then I'm gonna atrophy. Same thing with you. When you choose not to do the difficult things, you're going to atrophy, you're gonna get weak and then as you get weaker, it's going to get much harder, if not impossible, to do the things that you really need to do. So what if you and I are the same way? When we just sit around, we lose our tastiness, don't we? we what, what, if you, what if you keep moving and doing things that, that will make a difference in your life and then keep you fresh, if you will, in the culture, in your family, in your workplace? In Christianity, you see, we believe that, that Jesus Christ was crucified on a cross and then rose again on the third day. Now, Jesus' closest friends were told by Jesus that he was going to live again. So over in Mark 3, excuse me, Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 30, it says, From there they went out and began to go through Galilee, but they did not want anyone to know about it. This is, this is before Jesus died. Verse 31. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them the Son of Man, or himself, Jesus, was going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they were going to kill him. And when, they had been, when he had been killed, he will rise three days later. Listen to this in verse 32. But they did not understand this statement, but they were afraid to ask him. Some scholars think, maybe, that they couldn't comprehend this contradiction, this contradiction in, in, in expectations. Because in, in the text, in the Bible, Jesus was known by some or maybe viewed as some as, as the one to come set them free. Because in that culture 2,000 years ago, they were ruled by the Italian government and, and, and the Romans, and they had armor and swords, and, and they'd kill all kinds of people, right, all the time for a, a number of hundreds of years. So they thought that Jesus was going to come to deliver them from these evil people. Well, that's not what happened. In fact, they didn't even understand it when Jesus said that he was going to, to die in order to set people free. They, they just could not get it. In fact, they thought that Jesus was going to bring in a new kingdom, that they would be able to be top dog instead of semi-slaves. So the utter terror that Jesus was feeling, knowing that he was going to die horribly, didn't stop him. I wonder how many times you and I have been tempted to stop moving forward because of the terror that we're going through at the moment. It's so hard to keep moving forward when you're scared out of your mind. I can remember the first time I was in front of a, 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 a camera and people wanted to interview me and I, was, I just locked up. I just totally froze. What's going to happen when you start something new? When you have a game one attitude, you do what's difficult even though it's difficult. I'm telling you, this, this concept can change your life radically. Over in Hebrews chapter 12, in, in, in one text, it says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, listen, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Listen, his why, listen, his why pushed him through his fear. His why pushed him through his fear. Guess what? 
Your why, if you have a why that's big enough, hear me, if you have a why that's big enough and wide enough, and, and in, in, a, in a way that is bigger than you, your why needs to be big. It needs to be grand. It needs to be so huge that when you come through situations in your life, the why is going to get you out of bed. The why is going to get you to keep moving forward even though you are terrified at the moment. Roseanne Cash said one time, the key to change, listen, is to let go of your fear. The key to change is to let go of your fear. And for me, it was to face the fear, and Frank, to be very bluntly honest, to face my fear daily. Because to, my fear is to be quiet. My, my, my fear is, you know, I, I don't want to be out in front of the camera because I'm shy. I know you don't believe this, but I'm incredibly shy. I, I don't necessarily am comfortable in front of a camera. But it seems like some of the stuff that I teach is helping other people. So my why, again, is so big, it pushes me out of my fear. It pushes me to look past what I think that is terrifying for me or scary. It's getting easier, obviously, but it's still, it's still a challenge. So your why needs to be, be, be larger than your what. Your why needs to be larger than your what. There's a, there's a great quote that Theodore Roosevelt said years ago. Let me share it with you. You may have heard it. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how strong the man is who stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, listen, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again and again. Because there is no, listen, listen to this, there is no effort without error and shortcoming. Let me say it again. There is no effort without error or shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows, listen, in the end of triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least, listen, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. I would suggest that about 5%, maybe 10% of the public gets this concept. That those who achieve great things push themselves consistently day in and day out, even though they don't feel like it. I read a lot of books. And I'd say a good percentage of the books that I read, sometimes if, if, if the author is very candid, they will say that they also struggle to keep moving forward in the middle of the most difficult times. So you are not alone in it. I'm not alone in it. And there's a lot of wealthy people out there and a lot of well-known people who still struggle with it, but they keep moving forward. They keep going. Richie Norton wrote, listen, <laughs> to escape fear, you have to go through it, not around it. Let me say it again. To escape fear, you have to go through it and not around it. Over in the book of Matthew, in chapter 28 in the Bible, it says, now, this story, this, this uh, backstory is Jesus died on the cross, rose again on the third day. Remember I told you moments ago that Jesus' followers didn't get it. So in Matthew 28, starting in verse 5, it says, this is after some ladies went to the tomb of Jesus the angel, and there was an angel there, said to the, 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 the gals, Do not be afraid, listen, for I know that you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen, listen, just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. There are times when, after stuff happens, we have to be reminded what we were taught. Sometimes it sinks in after an event occurs. Has that ever happened to you? that you get it after something happened. There's times when we hit the accelerator in our lives after something tragic in our lives happened. How many times haven't you known people who started working out and started eating better when they had some major health problem or a relative of them passed of a sudden heart attack or they had a stroke or diabetes was starting to act up or other issues, other health issues, they started to take care of themselves after stuff happened. And this is like what happened here. 
And if you broaden that, that lens out even more, you're going to see that when Jesus rose from the dead, that his story, his message just grew and grew and grew. And now we're still talking about Jesus over 2,000 years later. Alice Abrams said, I love this quote, Alice Abrams said, In life, as in dance, grace glides on blistered feet. Let me say it again. In life, as in dance, grace glides on blistered feet. There's times when you and I struggle so much that our, our feet, our bodies, our minds, our emotions, our spirit is bleeding. We're bleeding, bleeding because of the pain. But have you ever noticed that when people struggle so much that they're aching on the inside, that the excellence comes out even in the middle of the pain? You can overcome anything that you choose to overcome if you don't stop when it starts to hurt. That is huge for me because I, me, I, I just want to stop. As soon as pain starts, I want to stop. But if you and I push through the pain, if you get past the pain, even though you know the pain's going to happen, so you're going to expect the pain, but you don't stop in the middle of the pain. Because if you don't stop in the middle of the pain, then good things will eventually happen. Somehow, somewhere, good things are going to happen. But if you stop in the middle of the pain, then you're going to go through other stuff that you have to really start all over again. You have to regress. You're going to have to go backwards. You're going to backslide. You're going to have to start all over again when you've paid the price for so many years up until now. Again, in life as in dance, grace glides on blistered feet. Stephen, Steve Jobs, he, he famously had this, uh, this talk he gave at a school one time. And he says, I didn't see it then, but it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. The heaviness of being successful was replaced by the lightness of being a beginner again. Less sure about everything, it freed me to enter one of the most creative periods of my life. He said, during the next five years, I started a company named Next, N-E capital X-T. Another company called Pixar, which you may have heard, and fell in love again with an amazing woman who became my wife. I'm pretty sure, listen, I'm pretty sure none of this would have happened if I hadn't been fired from Apple. Wow. Some of you watching this have been downsized. You've been fired. You've struggled. You've gone through some very, very stressful times in your life. But if you take that and use that as a stepping stone instead of a stumbling block, I think many times you're going to get where you want to get much, much faster. You know, so many times you and I have, have a, a, a challenge that there are people in your life that have created havoc in your life that have created an atmosphere that you did not want to be around, that have created such drama in your life that you wanted to, frankly, push them out of your life. Over in the book of Exodus, chapter 32, it talks about uh, Moses. And Moses had received the Ten Commandments, and that got all messed up. And so he went back into the mountain and received another set of the Ten Commandments. And then... While he was up in the mountain, Aaron, his brother, uh, was involved in some very difficult um, struggles, let me be kind. These people that he was trying to lead, they took gold and, and, make a go and made a golden calf. Instead of worshiping God, they said, we're going to worship this golden calf. And God got very, very angry about this. Well, Moses, who, if you don't know the backstory, Moses fought against this, this role of leadership for quite a long time. He came up with all these excuses why he didn't want to lead these people. And then now, in Exodus 32, when God said he's going to destroy all these people, Moses spoke up and said to God, well, look, if you're going to destroy these people, then you need to destroy me too. So many times, in the middle of your most frustrating time to stand up for other people who very candidly may not deserve for you to stand up for them can be one of the biggest challenges of all. Have you ever thought that maybe what you thought you could not do could become your biggest passion? This is just what I'm talking about here with Moses. 
He thought that he was the least qualified individual on the planet to do this great task. And then in time, we find out that, in fact, he is now talked about 4,000 years later as one of the best leaders of history. But in time, again, back to Exodus 32, it became his passion. He says, if you're going to write these, these folks off, then write me off too. Let me end with a story uh, by Pat Riley. In fact, Philip uh, Harrelson shares, the Los Angeles uh, basketball team were dominated by the Boston Celtics in their final round in 1984. The Lakers beat Boston on the home floor in game one. They beat them by 33 points in game three. They were ahead by 10 points in game four and cruising then and, and then everything changed. Two days after the deciding seventh game, the Lakers were back in Los Angeles for their last team meeting. Now, Coach Pat Riley looked at the young faces and said, quote, even though we lost, they can't take away our pride and our dignity. We own those. We are not chokers or losers. We are champions who simply lost the championship. The Lakers came back for the 84-85 season sharply focused. All year long they heard about how they were a showtime team that folded as soon as things got tough. The Celtics and their fans referred to us as the L.A. Fakers. Abuse and sarcasm were heaped on and the Lakers had to take it. Yet still they achieved a tremendous season and ripped through the pace and, and, and at such a high rate. It was incredible. On May 27th, they got to face their tormentor, the Celtics in Boston Garden. The next day's headlines called Game 1 of the 1985 Finals the Memorial Day Massacre. 148 to 114 humiliation was the most embarrassing game in the history of the Lakers franchise. The Lakers saw themselves become exactly what they had been called, choke artists, underachievers. The troubling question was why was it that every time the Lakers faced the Celtics, they became, listen, paralyzed with fear. Before they went out for game two, the Lakers gathered in their dingy locker room of the Boston Garden. The players were just sitting there, ready to listen and to believe. Every now and then, you have your back pushed up against a wall. It seems like there's nobody you can depend on but yourself. This is how the Lakers felt on that day. If they lost, the choke reputation would be chiseled into stone, a permanent verdict. If they won, they had an opportunity to prove they could keep on winning. It was a do-or-die situation. Have you ever been there, a do-or-die situation? Coach Riley faced Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the star center, and said, when I saw you and your father on the bus today, it made me realize what this whole moment is about. You spent a lot of time with Big Al today. Maybe you needed that voice. Maybe everyone in this room needs to hear that kind of voice right now. The, the voice of your dad. The voice of somebody in the past who was there when you didn't think you could get the job done. Let me repeat that one more time. The voice of your dad. The voice of somebody in the past who was there when you didn't think you could get the job done. A lot of you don't think you can win today. A lot of you don't think you can beat the Celtics. I want each of you to close your eyes and listen, and they did. And Riley began his tale. When I was nine years old, my dad told my brothers Lee and Lenny to take me down to Lincoln Heights and get me involved in the basketball games. Listen, they would throw me into the game, and I would get pushed and shoved. Day after day, I ran home crying and hid in the garage. I didn't want anything to do with basketball. This went on for two or three weeks. One night I didn't come to dinner, so my dad got up and walked out to the garage where he found me hungered down in a corner. He picked me up and, and put his arms around me and walked me to the kitchen. My brother Lee was upset with him. Why do you make us take him down there? He doesn't want to play. He's just too young. My father stood up and, and staring at Lee said, quote, I want you to take him there because I want you to teach him not to be afraid, that there should be no fear. Teaching him that competition, listen, competition 
brings out the very best and the worst in us. Right now, it brings out the worst. He then looked at his nine-year-old teary-eyed son and said, Pat, you have to go back there. So Coach Riley told his players, I thought I was never going to be able to get over being hurt and afraid, but I eventually did get over it, you see. And as he, as he was talking, he was slowly pacing back and forth in the locker room, looking at the players. He saw that Michael Cooper was crying. A couple of other players looked as if they started crying too. Coach Riley went on, quote, I don't know what it is going to take for us to win tonight, but I do believe that we're going out there like the Warriors and that we would make our fathers proud. The Lakers won the game. They also won three of the next four games. The 1985 championship was won by Lakers seven times in Lakers history. The final NBAs have been lost by their three adversaries. Now the, listen, now the Celtic myth was slain and the choke image with it. During the offseason, Michael Cooper told Coach Riley that the pregame message had gone deep for him. And as a boy, Cooper had a grievous leg wound, an ugly cut through the muscle. Doctors didn't think he would ever walk correctly again, much less become an athlete. He then, he was sustained through, listen, he was sustained through those times by a wonderful mom and a devoted uncle. So he heard those voices. All of us have at least one great voice deep inside. I hope I'm one of those voices, by the way. People are products of their environment. A lucky few are born into situations in which positive messages abound. Others grow up hearing messages of fear or failure and in which they must block out to hear the voice of the positive. But the positive and courageous voice will always emerge somewhere, sometime for all of us. Listen for it and your breakthroughs will come. So I end today with this message of Game On. Fear of failure, listen, fear of failure will lead you to despair, wrong decisions, and a host of other problems. But when the voice comes through with courage and counsel, and that you can achieve anything that you want to achieve, so whatever you're going through, listen, whatever you're going through, look past the frustration, look past the fear and the anger of the moment, and imagine what can happen if you adopt a game-on attitude.